Hello, I'm with Johnny Beerling, who's uh, revised his book. It's called Inside Radio 1, and the man here uh, is going to tell us about Hello, it. Hello, Stuart. Nice ah. to be with you. Um, so tell us why you decided to revise it. It's a book you wrote a few years ago. Yes, I did. I, I wrote it for Radio 1's 40th anniversary, and we're approaching the 50th now. So I thought it was time to update it in, in the light, particularly of what had happened with Jimmy Savile and, and some of those recent developments. And... Uh, I thought I could make a better book of it, frankly. I put more colour pictures in and revise some of the stories and what have you. And it's essentially a, a trot through your life in radio. Yes, it is. It covers the period uh, from 1957 when I joined the BBC to 1993 when I left it. Uh, after that, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> so what was it that got you into radio in the first place? Why did you oh, want well, to work in radio? Going back a long way now, I... Um, my dad was always keen on radios, you know, he used to wind his own coils and build transformers. and So I suppose it was put into me in, in a, a very early age. And then when I did my national service, which we had to do back in those days, before I went to college, I, uh, I wanted to be a pilot, but I, I, for various reasons, didn't succeed in that ambition. So they said, what else would you like to do? And I said, well, dad was always keen on radio, I'd like to learn about radio. And so they... Uh, trained me as a ground wireless fitter and I finished up after nine months training at Compton Bassett down in Wiltshire as a ground wireless fitter which meant that I was responsible for servicing all the equipment that the Air Force used in the control tower and in the various uh, offices and what have you around the around the Air Force so that was that was good fun and I got posted to Aden in the Middle East which is a very hot place and I was so fortunate, you know, life is quite like that, isn't it? Sometimes things crop up and uh, it works out for the best. But the chap who had been the studio technician at the Aden Forces Broadcasting Association, he was going home. He'd finished his two years service and the boss said, would you like to take over? And I said, wow, that sounds fantastic. I've always been keen on radio to work in it, you know, for the best part of a year would be wonderful. And so I became the studio technician for the Aden Forces Broadcasting Association. Now, there was one drawback to that, because they said, uh, you also have to do the early morning broadcasting. <laughs> well, I'd always fancied myself as a sort of budding David Jacobs or Pete Murray. So I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, go on the air from six till eight. We did the early morning request program and played records. And then from eight till 8.30, we relayed the general overseas service of the BBC, and then we shut down at 8.30 because the working day in Aden was from 8 till 1 because mm. of the climate. And so that was my life for the best part of uh, nine months I, I was doing that down there. And, and you mentioned David Jacobs and Pete Murray. You then went to work for the BBC and got to meet these people. I got to meet them and actually started playing the records <laughs> for them. Well, what happened was, whilst I was in Aden, a, a chap came out. He had a marvellous job. His name was Peter West. He wasn't the famous Peter West, but he had to go around the world checking on the reception of the General Overseas Service to see how we relayed it and what sort of aerials we had and what the signal was like and so on. So he took me to lunch. This was my first ever business lunch. There I was about 18 and a half, 19. And he took me to the Rock Hotel in Aden and uh, we had lunch and I said, you know, I didn't really want to be a school teacher. I'd like to work in radio full time. Oh, I'll put a word in for you, old chap, when I get back, you see. So uh, that was the start of it all. I came back and knocked on the door of the BBC and they invited me to join as a technical operator. Now, I was so naive then. I thought, well, a technical operator would be the man who operates the equipment in the studios and does the sound mixing and, and what have you. I found out after I was in, <laughs> it was a bit like being press ganged, that uh, what you were doing there was to, um, well, polish the, the double-ended jacks that connected various things, monitor things in the bowels of the BBC and uh, make sure the studios were all working. And I found out that the people who did the operating were called studio managers, terribly posh, and they all had degrees in sociology or philosophy or something there. Didn't seem to know much about engineering. <laughs> but the attitude of the BBC was that these people are artistic and you can't possibly be artistic if you're a, an engineer. So uh, I was an engineer and I had to change from being an engineer, a technical operator, to become a studio manager. And, of course, I didn't have a degree, not having been to university, but uh, I was very lucky. Somebody took a chance on about six of us and six TOs eventually got trained up as studio managers and we learned how to mix sound, how to play records how to edit tape, which was just coming in in those days, and um, it was wonderful. I took to it, um, you know, just 
I thought it was the most marvellous yeah. thing I could possibly do. I didn't have any ambition to do anything more than just become a studio a studio operator. And I was a studio manager playing the records for programmes like Housewife's Choice and uh, Two Way Family Favourites. And of course, Pete Murray and David Jacobs. A wonderful time. And, uh, ten years at the Light programme, and essentially you were producing programmes there by the end. Which... Yes, that was 1957 that I joined, and I went on and... Well, Radio 1 started in 1967, 10 years later. And, of course, I had been working on all those popular music programmes. There were two departments that made programmes in the Old Light programme. There was the popular music department. They were the boys that recorded sessions in the BBC studios and mixed them with records. And then there was the gramophone department, terribly posh. The gramophone department was run by a formidable lady called Anna Instone, and she was responsible for... Any programme that used commercial records, whether it was classical or pop or whatever. And so I worked for Anna Instone in the gramophone department and was appointed a producer there after about five or six years. And so I, I too was then uh, producing things like Midday Spin and Housewife's Choice and all those popular music programmes of the BBC broadcast and the old light programme days. <laughs> and from the, the mid-60s, of course, the BBC was quite stuffy with the light programme, but along came the pirate radio stations. Would you go home and listen to those rather than oh, listening yes. to the programmes you were I making? Mean, when, I, when I was a producer, I was doing programmes, a thing called Music to Midnight, 10 till midnight, and I'd finish at midnight, and I was by then living down in the middle of Kent, and I would have to drive home, and I would listen to... Radio London, that was my favourite. This was modelled on WABC in New York, but it, it was a wonderful station. And uh, there was one particular announcer I took a shine to, a chap called Duncan Johnson, who had a very dark brown voice. And uh, one day I was in a pub at Marble Arch. I think it was a Pie Records reception, and somebody said, oh, you've always wanted to meet Duncan Johnson. I said, yes, he's one of my idols. I love his late-night programme. And they said, well, there he is. And there was this sort of tall, pimply youth looking about 18. And it wasn't at all quite, you know, it's always the way with radio, isn't it? Yeah. You form an impression of what the person looks like. And uh, Duncan wasn't like that, but he was a great guy. And, of course, he did join the original team of Radio 1 with Crack the Clue. <laughs> that was a... What yeah, a quiz that he ran. So when Radio One was going to come along, they kind of picked you and a few other people to to work on it ahead of launch. Yes, those of us that had been in popular music and in gramophone departments were asked which which new station we wanted to work with. You see, they had devised a program. They had seen the threat from pirate radio and realised that they had to change. And a man called Jerry Mansell wrote a report called Broadcasting in the Seventies, and in it he outlined the plan to set up four basically generic rep networks. So they replaced the old Home Light and Third with Radio 1, 2, 3 and 4. And uh, we were asked which one we wanted to work in. And Naturally, having come from a sort of pop music background and an interest in big bands and, and music, I opted to work for Radio 1. And I had been producing the last sort of year of the Old Light programme, a, a show called Where It's At on... Uh, Saturday afternoons with the infamous Chris Denning but uh, he was a good DJ despite his other shortcomings and um, this was very much modelled on pirate radio we even made our own jingles because the BBC didn't have jingles in those days so I would cut the beginnings and ends of big band records together and get Duncan Johnson with his dark brown voice to say the light programme news you see or whatever the feature was that I wanted so we made up little jingles Kenny Everett used to make up spoof commercials, which we dropped in, which is very <laughs> odd on the BBC. Yes. Croxton's thigh jelly, I remember, was one of the <laughs> products. You can read all about it in the book. And yeah, I and, think and there's scripts from one or two of those. There is a lot in the book as well, obviously, about the birth of Radio 1, and a lot of people yes. know about that already, so we won't go into too much detail about it. But Actually, you say a lot of people remember it, but... The people that remember it will all be in their 60s and 70s. <laughs> well, a lot of people They've have probably read got about Alzheimer's it. and yeah. can't remember it. <laughs> but there's a lot been written about it, a yes, lot been yes. said about it. So, I mean, let's get into Radio 1 then. Here it was, 1967. You've got half the DJs from the Pirate Stations, half the DJs from the Light Programme and elsewhere. It, it, 
still at that point, it was massive. Obviously, it became massive in the 70s and 80s, but even in 67, on launch day, was it a behemoth? Well, it was a very strange blend for people, <laughs> if you remember, because people like Stuart Henry and Roscoe were in caftans and bells and beads, and people like Don Moss and Pete Murray and David Jacobs were all in their suits with their ties because they had been brought up that way yeah. in the BBC. So you had a sort of a... A mixture of the cultures from the, from the two backgrounds, but it, it was fun, and I can remember very clearly uh, John Dunn, who later became a well-known Radio Two personality. But he was a newsreader on the opening day, and at twelve thirty, in the middle of Emperor Roscoe's show, who was going, "Have mercy, Mister Percy," and so on. He said, "Oh no, here is the news in English," <laughs> something which you would understand. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously you were Tony Blackburn's first producer on, on The Breakfast Show. You then on, went on to be a senior producer through the, the 70s. Yes. And you seem to have had a lot of freedom to come up with ideas and just run with things. Yes, I did. I suppose it, I wasn't conscious. I wasn't particularly ambitious. As I said, I, I'd never had any ambition beyond wanting to be a studio operator. Then when I became a producer, I thought this is a wonderful job. And I, I suppose... My natural enthusiasm came through. I was always thinking up new ideas and, and different things. And uh, one of the things I thought was that when, by 1972, we knew that commercial radio in the UK was coming. And I thought that we have to get away from this perception that Radio 1 is that station down there in London, living in Yorkshire. Now I can understand that even better. But there is a perception, isn't there, that the BBC is London-dominated, which is why we have the, the media city at Salford now. And... Um, So I devised a programme called uh, the Radio One Club. This was an adaptation of a programme that originally Derek Chinnery had produced called um, Pop In. And the idea of Pop In was that literally the audience could wander into this converted cinema in Lower Regent Street and see a DJ playing records, but also meet some of the pop stars who would turn up for for interviews to promote their, their latest record. And so um, Radio One Club, the idea was that people would sign up, become members, get a membership card, and they could come into the club. And and rather than just do it in the Paris cinema in Lower Regent Street, we would do it in various places up and down the country and use the power of the BBC and, and the various offices that we had in Manchester, Birmingham, Belfast, Glasgow, and so on. And so originally we started just uh, doing it two ways. We'd, we'd do one in Manchester mixed with one in London. We'd have two presenters, one at each end, mm-hmm. and live groups playing from, from the area. I mean, it was great fun and it was hugely popular. In fact, it was so popular after about four years we had to take it off because there was so much truancy and people <laughs> getting away from And uh, instead you, you took, a, took a van to beaches instead and around the coast. Ah, around. well then after a gap of 18 months or so, I had a young family then and we used to take them on holiday to France camping. And I was down in the in the south of France one night and I saw these people trotting along with their little aluminium chairs and being nosy, I wandered and followed them. And there they were in front of a big um, Arctic vehicle with a stage that opened up from the side. And, and they were doing a show which is a bit like a sort of radio version of Sunday night at the London Palladium with live bands playing and comedians and what have you. And... I thought this would be a marvellous way to promote Radio 1 if we could do something similar and take it round the seaside resorts of the UK. And thus was born the Radio 1 Roadshow. But of course it, it wasn't easy to get it started because the BBC didn't have that sort of vehicle in those days. And we inquired around and uh, we found there was a man down in Bristol called John Miles. And John had... Um, being the manager of Adge Cutler and the Wurzels. And one of our producers said, I think John has a sort of removal van or something with a side that opens and the Wurzels play their mm-hmm. fairs and fates. So I went to see John and he said, well, I don't have that anymore. He was very Bristolian, was John. And uh, he said, but I'll I'll build something. My, my brother Tony is a bodybuilder and he will build you a van and we'll tow it with a Range Rover and we'll hire it to the BBC. I think it was... Hundred pounds a day, and so this was eventually built. Terrible problems because Tony, I didn't know Tony John's brother, had not any experience of towing. <laughs> and when we loaded this portable stage up, and we built the thing as a prototype and tried it out in a hangar down in Bristol, and that all worked fine. But when they packed it all up and put the stage panels in, 
The vehicle was so heavy that it was wobbling like a Marilyn Monroe walking down the street. And uh, so there were all sorts of problems like that. But eventually they got there and they, they towed it down to... Newquay was where the first one, 1973. And we set up and uh, that was the first problem was we were in the car park of a cafe on North Bistral Beach. <laughs> Alan Freeman was the DJ. And the engineer said, oh, I don't seem to have a long enough mains cable to get the power to the van from the cafe. So we said, well, that's not a problem. We'll go to the local electricity board and, uh, and uh, buy some cable. All right, my dear, you come down here to Cornwall. You can't have nothing like that unless you've got a, an order form on BBC. I did no paper, you see. So that was another problem. Luckily, we had a very bright secretary who carried BBC notepaper, so she typed up an order form and we duly got our 100 metres of cable, probably 100 yards in those days. Mm. And uh, and that was it. So uh, we got powered up, Fluff did his stuff, and not off, and the people were lovely. I mean, it, it was a success right from the beginning, except there was a lot of enthusiasm from the holiday makers who'd been there all day drinking scrumpy. I think we went on there <laughs> at 5 o'clock till 7 in those days. And so by the time we'd finished the show, they were all pretty happy. And then Fluff would sit around for an hour signing autographs. And then the engineers would have to start to de-rig this thing. Now, I rather stupidly, in this six-week holiday period, decided I would try and get right round the coast of the UK. So these poor devils had a terrible drive, perhaps 150, yeah. 200 miles to the next site. They wouldn't arrive till 2 and 3 in the morning. Then they'd have to start rigging ready for the next transmission <laughs> at 5 o'clock the following afternoon. But uh, it was a success, and it, it was hugely popular. After the first year, we reckon something like half a million people had been to see it. And what was it really? A man playing records in a box on the beach with a few guests and a few games yeah. thrown in. But it, it just took off. It was an amazing vehicle for promoting Radio 1 and, and for promoting pop groups as well, because they were all itching to come down. And I can only describe the atmosphere as being rather like Cliff Richard's summer holiday, but we did it for real. Mike Reed would bring his guitar. Tony Miles emerged as a character called Smiley Miley, because he mm -hmm. was always, how far have we travelled? Yeah. We'd do the game and the mileage game, how far we've travelled, and we'd play bits and pieces, which was a game where people had to identify ten pieces of music cut together. And then, of course, various pop groups would come along. So there was a, a huge family atmosphere, and... The whole crew worked together for the whole of the week. So there was a producer, a secretary, a DJ, two or three engineers and a rigger driver, and then Tony Miles with his setup. Now, the first year, the thing was sponsored by BBC Records. They put a bit of money in for, in return for some branding on a, uh, the back of the caravan, and we had a sort of stable door on, on the side. So there was a girl employed to sell T-shirts and BBC Records whilst we were broadcasting mm -hmm. from the front. And that was all right, but she wasn't particularly good at it. And, and Tony Miles spotted the opportunity and said, how would it be if the second year I set up a sales vehicle? And uh, Tony Fish, sadly no longer with us, who finished up as the manager of Radio York, he came up with the idea of the Goodie Mobile, selling Radio One goodies, yeah. which started off as T-shirts and hats and stickers and then broadened out into badges and a Radio One magazine and all sorts of things. But... Uh, wow. It was hugely successful. Mars Brothers took a license from the BBC in return for the rights to manufacture and sell the goods. And of course it gave us extra hands in, in terms of helping with the rigging and, and the organisation. And it grew eventually. There were two goodie mobiles, you know, because there was such a queue for, for all of this uh, gear that it was it was just marvellous the way it took off. And as I say, it was the atmosphere was like Cliff Richard's summer holiday because the whole team travelled together. They stayed in a hotel together and we'd perhaps have a barbecue on the beach if the weather was nice and somebody else would bring a guitar. And it was, it was just wonderful. And obviously the roadshow and the merchandise did what you'd intended it to do because through the 70s and the 80s, it was this massive radio station, the biggest in Europe. Yes, and, and I'd seen the way... I was a very great fan, along with Noel Edmonds and Mike Smith, of, of Formula One racing. And we'd seen the way the teams were all branded up. And I thought we should follow this through and brand Radio One. And our colours were red, white and blue. And we had the famous ice cream jackets, as somebody <laughs> used to say behind my back, beeling with his ice cream jackets. 
But it, it did work. I mean, everything was branded. We used to get a car from Ford's press fleet and they would give us a little white Escort Mexico in which the producer would drive around in and that was branded up. So everything was promoting Radio 1 and getting it into a strong position before commercial radio started. Yeah, and at the time that you then stepped up from being one of the, the senior producers to, to controller was at a time where that explosion of commercial radio was happening, I guess. It yes, was it was. Exciting uh, by time then I was an executive producer and uh, we came up with the notion of expanding the, the road show and the Radio 1 Club into Radio 1 Weeks Out. And by a strange coincidence, <laughs> these weeks out always happened when there was a new commercial station <laughs> happening. I think the first one we ever did was in Manchester when Piccadilly was opening. And for that, we saturated the town. We built a studio and a hotel, a sort of continuity and, and what have you. And then we had the road show going around various locations. And then we would build another studio in a shop window. It might be Boots or WH Smith or somewhere like that. So people could see all the time what was going on. And then we'd have the radio car going around. So all the programs were out and about. And it was huge in terms of entertaining the public but it was also very very good internally for bonding everybody you know the whole the whole team what had happened with the road show in miniature with perhaps a half a dozen people with the radio one week out you've got 40 or 50 people all living together in the hotel and there was a lot of hijinks and fun and games in the evening and uh, I can remember we used to have sing songs in the bar and Derek Chinnery was the boss then and he would say come on you chaps it's time we all went to bed and they would all trot out and follow him into the lift up to his floor and then he would go into his room and they'd all come down again and carry on singing <laughs> and Tony Blackburn would sing at the piano and Paul Williams one of the producers would play and it was just Fantastic atmosphere, it really was. Lots of stories in the book about uh, about the fun and games that, that people got up to on tour as well. I mean, uh, looking at your last eight years then at Radio 1 where you were the big boss, there was a lot went on then. You had Live Aid, you went on FM. Oh my word, there was yes. Big well, changes that was going a on, continual there? struggle, you know, from when Radio 1 started. It took 20 years before we got an FM network, which is really evidence... I think of the lack of faith that senior management in the BBC ever had in the, in the, in the thing. They probably didn't were somewhat embarrassed that they were having a station that did nothing but play music, popular music all day of various kinds. And so everybody else, I mean, the commercial stations all were on AM and FM, and poor old Radio One was on two four seven meters, which was an appalling. Service. I mean, it was almost as bad as Radio Luxembourg after dark. <laughs> About half the country couldn't hear it, and it was fading in and out. It was sort of on the same frequency as uh, Radio Albania, so that was difficult. And then a bit later, they relented, and they gave us the old Radio 3 medium waves, which was 275 and 285, or 1089 and 1053, if you wanted, in, in kilohertz. And so we had to promote the changeover and get people to switch over. And then eventually we got one VHF FM transmitter in the southeast of England. It was about 101, I think, FM. And then eventually, after 20 years, when I took over in 1985, they finally found the money and the space to put us on FM across the whole country, which was just a, a wonderful time. So, And that coincided with, as I say, 1985, when I took over, um, with the opportunity to broadcast Live Aid. We had done a, a similar operation the year before with John Reed, Elton John's manager, and Mel Bush, the promoter. It was called the Summer of 84, which was in Wembley Stadium. And uh, John and Mel had promoted this, and we had broadcast it live. So we had it was, it was almost like a dummy run for Live Aid. And I'm very proud of the fact that I still think it was probably the biggest ever show of its kind that there was. I mean, there was Nebworth and other things and Glastonbury, what have you, but as a one-off event, it was just huge. And of course, there were enormous problems in, in technical and um, political problems. BBC didn't like its airways being used to solicit for money. I don't think Children in Need had started then. And uh, Alan Yentob was controller of BBC Two, I was controller of one, and we had to go and see Michael Checkland and persuade him of the wisdom of broadcasting this because as, Yento, as um, Bob Geldof said, if you can't promote the thing, there's no effing way you're going to get the rights to broadcast it, you see. So that was one of the things that we had to sort out. And then there was the actual sound itself. I mean, traditionally in the past, 
the sound engineers from television had done their sound and radio engineers had done the radio sound. But because of the complexity, there wasn't room for two, two sets of sound mixing equipment. It was complicated enough as it was. And so uh, they had to take radio sound, which they were not terribly happy about. But they did in the end. There was a compromise over that. And it was just the sheer complication of the, the size of it all, if you think of the number of concerts. Because it wasn't just London and America. There were all other countries involved as well. But eventually we did it, and it all worked beautifully until towards the end of the Live Aid day. It was just getting dark, you know, and the twilight was coming and the lights dimmed and the top of the bill was coming on and it was Paul McCartney and he started to play the intro on the piano and then the vocal mic wasn't working that was the first time out of all those hundreds of microphones that had been on and so it was like one minute 40 I think or something like that of, of silence you know just with the piano playing and, and no McCartney but uh, Jeff Griffin who was one of the senior producers responsible for it had decided to record it in multi-track and did it on eight track. And uh, McCartney kindly consented to come back in afterwards. So if you buy the DVD now, you find that missing vocal is magically there. And it's all thanks to Jeff's foresight. And I think that was a great story. Wow. And so when the early 90s came along, you've got this 25 year old radio station that's still got a lot of the listeners who were listening 25 years yeah, ago. Exactly. The BBC decided they want to change it and you weren't going to be a part well, of that. Well, that was one of the problems. I'd been there far too long by then. I'd been there since it started and, and 25 years later I was still there and the audience was still there. It hadn't changed. You know, people liked it so much they didn't switch over. And so I realised there needed to be changes and John Burt was particularly keen. He was worried that the BBC's charter would be renewed and they would have Radio 1 taken away. So he wanted Radio 1 to be young and radically different. Now, I didn't object to this, but I could see the problem. And what I wanted to do was to take a lot of those older disc jockeys like Dave Lee Travis, Simon Bates, Steve Wright, Alan Freeman, Bob Harris, Gary Davis, take them to Radio 2. I said, let me go and run Radio 2, and then you can change Radio 1. You can use the power of the BBC's marketing to move the audience across. John Burt didn't want to do that, nor did Liz Forbin. She was the managing director of radio by this time, and uh, she thought it would disadvantage the existing Radio 2 audience. So um, I left, and it took another 10 years before Jim Moyer came along and did exactly what I'd outlined, and now Radio 2 is the big station. But had they done it the way I had suggested, I maintain they needn't have lost the audience that they did, because Matthew Bannister took over from me, and did what John Burt wanted, changed it radically and made it a young person station. But he moved everything and people love their radio and they love the familiarity of knowing what they're going to get on yeah. Radio 5 at this time or Radio 4 at this time. And uh, he changed everything so radically that he got very bad press and they lost about 10 million listeners, which was unnecessary really they could have done it in a more subtle way yeah and out of all your time at the BBC from you know producing light program uh, items to the road show to jingles to FM radio uh, to managing the talent what what do you see as the most important thing you did when you were there and what did you enjoy the most well Live Aid was obviously one of the most important one of the other big things I did, which we haven't talked about, was to spend a year producing a definitive documentary history of the Beatles. Yeah. And that was uh, originally 13 one hours, and then eventually we expanded it when we repeated it to uh, 14 one hours, which told the whole story from beginning to end. And that was an amazing amount of work, but fascinating because I travelled the world uncovering recordings of them and uh, putting it all together and assembling it and... Uh, and there was a lot more programs on, the, on, on Radio 1 then, almost like Radio 4 is now, with shorter programs doing more Yes, things. well, one of the things we wanted to do was to tell people about the background to the music we played. So there was a documentary nearly every week telling mm -hmm. the background of some aspect of music. And uh, in fact, the culmination of, of that documentary was a 26-part series called The History of Pop, which went from the beginning to the end of it. Yeah. Well, up to the present time when it was broadcast. Good um, fun. Yeah, and uh, lots of funny stories in the book as well. What, what's, <laughs> what's the kind of 
most laugh out loud moment do you think for readers when they're reading I think it? the funny story that I did one whole chapter on um, pluggers and their cunning stunts paraphrase Kenny Everett and um, there's a story in there about a, a producer called Don George who was a great one for going for lunch with the pluggers and he would not miss lunch at any price and uh, well there's an extract here from my, my book which I read myself of telling the story of Don and his lunch have a listen Richard Evans. Richard is a Nottingham lad who started at Decca and became promotion boss of Epic Records and later as an independent. He was the source of much fun and laughter in our world. This is what he said. I just got a job at Decca. I'd been there about six months and I had to get a record onto Junior Choice and I knew that to do this I needed to take out the producer Don George for lunch. Don was a legendary luncher and there was a waiting list to take him out. Decker had a subsidiary label, York Records, owned by Deke Arlen. And as I was not doing very well with them, Deke hired his brother-in-law, Phil Betts, who was a schoolteacher, to do the plugging. It was my job to introduce him to everyone. After months of negotiating, I managed to fix a lunch with Don George. I had booked us into a converted barge, the Bark and Bite, on the Regent's Canal. At eleven that morning, Don phoned. I was dreading he was going to cancel, but no, my son's very ill and I have to take him to hospital, but I'm still coming for lunch. I just want you to know I'm going to be a bit late. So Phil and I went to the restaurant, had a gin and tonic while we waited. Don turned up eventually, very apologetic. We were sitting with our backs against the wall and Don sat down opposite to us. The menus came, Don got stuck into a G&T and the wine and we started to talk. Don was a devout Catholic and I'd warned Phil, who was very left-wing, to stay off politics, but this was early February 1972, a week or so after Bloody Sunday. Inevitably we got onto this topic and from there, before I had a chance to interrupt, it moved into the Catholic religion and homosexuality. I knew then I'd lost control. I tried every way to change the subject, but to no avail. I could do nothing except listen as these two were locked in heated debate. Don made some politically incorrect statement to the effect that all puff should be burned at the stake. Phil retorted, and before I knew it, Don had picked up the menu and was slapping Phil round the head with him. This amused the other diners until Don picked up the open bottle of Mouton Cadet and made to hit Phil with it. Of course, the wine started to fly everywhere. Worse, sitting still behind him was a woman from the Sunday Times who was banged over the head by Don's backstroke. By this time I was about ready to cry. I was only saved by the waiters who dragged Don off Phil and threw him out into the street. Well, I didn't know what to do. I could not imagine Don was going to play our record after that and I was sure I was going to be fired. I had visions of being banned from Radio 1 forever. What could I do? I ordered a bottle of champagne for us. Phil and I finished our lunch, had a couple of large brandies while we considered my future. While I was still in the restaurant, digesting the brandy, the waiter came over with a message. There's a phone call for you, sir. It was Don. Richard, he said. That man Phil's homosexual. He was touching me up under the table. Well, Don, he's married with three kids, so I'm surprised, covering my ass. but I'll make sure everyone knows about him. When I got back to the office, Deke Arlen was all in favour of suing Don George but my intention was to cover it up, and my boss, Don Wardell, was also in favour of smoothing everything over. I then had a phone call from Don George's boss at the BBC, Teddy Warwick, who asked me to come in and give my side of the story, which luckily Teddy believed, as he said, if Phil had been a homosexual, Don George is the last person he would have touched up, so I lived to plug some more. There's another funny story, you know, about... uh the history of censorship on the BBC. It's one of the things I talk about when I go on the, the ships now. I call it the naughty songs. And the reasons, various reasons, why records were banned on the BBC. But one of the more interesting things was that the uh, breach of copyright could cause the BBC all sorts of problems. And uh, I found this extract here from a, uh, a memo written by a man called Stephen Edwards. Stephen Edwards was the head of copyright. And it's the sort of memo that you would get Would you please notify producers within your service that the gramophone record entitled Bollocks to Christmas, which includes a parody of White Christmas, must not be broadcast 
Failure to observe this ruling could result in legal action being taken against the corporation. Now, what you've got to note there is that the ban wasn't because of the title, it was because of the breach of copyright. <laughs> I mean, there are all sorts of other reasons why records were banned, whether it was drug references or advertising or whatever, you know, but uh, that, I think, was, was quite a funny one. And there's, the, the book will be enjoyable by people who work in radio and people who just have memories of listening to radio. Yes, I think so. I mean, you have to think... Uh, it started nearly 50 years ago, so if you're in your 20s, then you'll be in your 70s now. So it's, it's a nice Christmas present for uh, anybody who's got a sort of with it granny or grandma, you know, and say, you remember you used to listen to Radio 1 when you were 20, granny? Well, you know, here you are. So I, I do suggest that anybody who's interested in radio would, would find it a very suitable Christmas present, and they can get it off my website, uh, Beeling. .co.uk but I'm, I'm very happy to sign it and, and put a personal message in if, if people want to have one excellent thanks for talking to us Johnny my pleasure and best of luck with the book good